Radio. I am your gracious host. My name is Tariq Nasheed. And today's show is brought to you specifically by Black Star Survival. That's a black owned website. It's an outdoor urban survival emergency preparedness shop. They have ammo, firearm accessories, tactical gear, all aimed at being on top of your game and being able to protect yourself. Check out Black Star Survival. Dot com. Again, BlackStarSurvival.com. Definitely check them out right now. We're going to have a very robust conversation on tonight's broadcast. We're going to talk about that farce of a reparations hearing that they had earlier. But we're going to take another quick commercial break, and we're not going to be that long. So y'all let everybody know we're live. Don't move a muscle. We'll be right back right here on Tariq Radio. Yo, you still ain't getting women? Really? Come on, son. You need to go to badboymembership.com and step up your game. What's up, y'all? It's your boy, Mr. Locario, the bad boy of the dating game. And I'm telling you that if you really want to attract beautiful women, you need to go to badboymembership.com. This is where you get 45 through 90 minute step-by-step dating advice tutorials every month. Just sign up, follow the advice, and you'll get the woman you want. Go to badboymembership.com. That's badboymembership.com. Yo, check out the new music artist, Professor Archibald, and his new release, The Workforce Struggle EP. It's available right now on every streaming platform, YouTube, Apple Music, Amazon, Tidal, and many, many more. My man, Professor Archibald, also produces music as well, so if you need beats, hit him up on Twitter at ArchieProfess, or you can email him at ArchieBeats28 at gmail.com. Attention parents and teachers, are you looking for something that will educate and relate to our children? If so, you need to order the Gifted and Lit Bundle today. Gifted and Lit, that's an educational program that uses hip-hop to teach children mathematics, science, entrepreneurship, and much, much more. This bundle includes two DVDs, two CDs, a coloring book, and a workbook. Order your copies right now at giftedandlit.com. Again, that's giftedandlit.com. What's up, family? We're finally beginning to get on code for justice and economic empowerment, and now we got to make our empowerment a lifestyle. So I introduce to you On Code Clothing. On Code Clothing is our thing, all black, everything, and fly. But make no mistake, this gear is exclusive and it's not for everyone. You got to be grassroots aligned and in the know to truly appreciate this lifestyle brand. So check us out now at OnCodeClothing.com. Sign up and save 10% and enjoy free shipping on most orders. Again, that's OnCodeClothing.com. The year is 2079. The futuristic nation of New Albion has been created to maintain a new racial apartheid system. There is a planned genocide that is going to target the nation's black population. A small group of black revolutionaries band together to launch guerrilla warfare attacks against their oppressors. Do they fail or do they succeed? Find out the answer by reading the book, Avoid the Machines, the new novel by author Scotty Vasco. Avoid the Machines, now available on Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. You are now tuning into the legendary Tariq Nasheed. I gave him the blood on that bridge in Selma. On Tariq Radio. I said, whoever threw that paper, your mom's a hoe. Yo, what's going on, family? We're here. We're here. We're here. Glad to have y'all tuning in. Glad that y'all stayed up late with me tonight on this Juneteenth day. Today is Juneteenth. And unfortunately, the Democrats turned it into Coonteenth because there was a lot of coonery, buffoonery, a lot of butter biscuits being passed around earlier today. All the butter biscuits were all over the place today, family. 
it's been one hell of a day, man. I've been up early watching these hearings. I hope you guys have seen the reparations farce that we've all been warning y'all about. We've been warning everybody about this reparations hearing that they were going to have. We already knew from the outset that it was going to be a sham job. We already knew. We were pointing out the people involved, you know, with Sheila Jackson Lee and all the language they were using even before this thing popped off. They were already talking about, well, we ain't really focusing on payments for reparations. So we already knew, but the the trash and the sham and the garbage was just more immense than we ever imagined. It was babble fest. It was just like we predicted. I told y'all it was going to be a whole bunch of truth and reconciliation talk. Everybody talking about their feelings and how bad racism is and how bad black people have, has had it in this country. And, they, and another thing they would try to do, they kept trying to put racism in the past. They kept the whole narrative they kept doing. They kept trying to talk about how bad slavery was and how bad black people had it for a short period of time and then it got better after civil rights. This was the, the kind of this was the narrative they kept spinning. They kept talking about, well, up until the 50s, up until the 1960s, black people had to go through Jim Crow and all that stuff before we had civil rights. They act like civil rights erased all the anti-black hatred. So the whole thing, again, it was that, like we predicted, it was going to be a bunch of, let's talk about feelings, how how we feel about being mistreated. There was one, they were, they were bringing all of these Democratic and Republican shields on there. And one thing you have to understand, there's no difference between a Democratic coon and a Republican coon. They had right and left wing coons out there. That's the thing. We've been sleeping on these Republican and Democratic coons. The Democratic coons are just as bad. The left wing Democratic coons are just as bad. And usually the Democratic coons are nine times out of ten. They get immigrants to be the Democratic coons. I want y'all to notice that the Republican coons are generally old school, homegrown Jesse Lee Peterson types, that plantation they're, they're holdovers from the plantation, but those are usually the older ones or their domestic bedwinches. But the Democratic coons are usually the immigrants. They get these people, they understand that there's a lot of immigrant coons who are aching to get them some butter biscuits and they'll throw us under the bus. So they know how to, how to fish from that immigrant coon pool. They know there's a whole pool of immigrant coons that's just chomping at the bit to throw us under the damn bus. They know that and they know how to help them erase their background so they can mix in. This is why we got to be very careful about people who are coming out to the forefront supposing supposing to represent us. We got to look into people's background when they're trying to speak for foundational black Americans. But With this whole farce, this whole thing was the Democrats trying to get a black agenda on their resume. This whole farce is going to be their black agenda. This whole talking in circles, nothing burger ass reparations hearing that didn't talk about any solutions, anything tangible. It didn't talk about doing anything for black Americans. They're going to use this on their resume. So when they're running next year, when they're campaigning a little harder, they're going to be like, well, we talked about Hispanic issues. We talked about black issues. So we didn't ignore black people. We talked about black issues, right? We had a whole big old reparations hearing for black people. So we're not ignoring black people. We had a we had a whole big old thing for black people. Um, He was involved and Cobra was involved. Sheila Jackson Lee. I mean, this is this is how we care. We had this big old meeting about black people that's how they're going to try to frame this guys this is how they're going to try to flip and spin this 
train wreck that happened today. This was a damn train wreck. Don't let them spin this as if it's some type of positive because that's what they're going to do. This was a nothing burger. This was disrespectful. It was venomous towards black society because it was hateful. They put people on there to really throw other black folks under the bus, to undermine black people, to throw our our needs out of the window. We we can't uh, I don't think we fathom how disrespectful this filth they put on today was to black Americans. This was extremely disrespectful to black Americans. And I want to play a few clips. I don't want to play too many because again, it was just a bunch of nothing burgers. Um, you had a whole ma- hash mashup of random ass people too. You had people on here that was extremely random. They had some former football playing coon who nobody really knows, Burgess Owens. And again, they get these people because they they've already coon vetted them. They made sure that they're nice and coonies. Then they had Danny Glover on here. He's Sambo babbling. He ain't really saying nothing. Then they had Ty Nisi Coates on here. He's just kind of being neutral to a certain degree. He's not saying anything. And they had this Coleman Hughes guy on there, some random dude whose only purpose was to go on there and shit on black people. But it was a mashup of, of nitwits, losers, clowns, and coons. Then they had a couple of white people on there talking about What would Jesus do? They literally had a white woman on there talking about what would Jesus, how would Jesus feel about reparations? Would you go to Native Americans and Jewish people talking that type of talk? They wouldn't do that in a million damn years. These people think so lowly of us. Thank goodness there's a new generation of awakened black people out here that's not going for the okie doke and shout out to all the black people who were outside and also inside because people were inside booing the hell out of those folks with all that coonery shout out to the brothers and sisters that was out there really giving them that work a lot of the people showed up and they were opposing the fuckery there but they were trying to run that game but let me play a a few short clips. I don't want to get too, too much into a lot of the coonery that was going because they weren't really talking about nothing. Now, this one guy, this is Burgess Owens. And he was a, he's a right wing coon. And he's talking. He started talking about the Democrats are responsible for slavery. He, he was running that whole that's that old Ben Shapiro stuff that they they put that type of garbage together at the National Review and all of these other white supremacist think tanks, that time-wasting argument where they want to blame the Democrats and blame the Republicans. It's the whole who's on first hot potato. He's the racist. No, he's the racist. No, he's the real racist. No, he's the real. And both of them are racist. So that's another time-wasting tactic that they use. But let me play this Sambo. Hold on. Believe in restitution. Let's point to the party that was, that was part of slavery, KKK, Jim Crow, that has killed over 40% of our black babies, 20 and million now, of them. Uh, hold on. This whole thing about the Democrats started the KKK. Let me tell you something. The Democrats became the Republicans later on. That's why the Democrats created the Confederate flag. And who flies the Confederate flag today? Who fights for Confederate monuments today? Who was running around there in Charlottesville fighting for Confederate monuments? The right. Unite the right. So don't let them run that whole, it's the Democrat. No, it's the Republican. It's the Democrat. The you know, Confederacy. All of them are the same. All right? Don't let them run that game. It's who's on first. State of California, 70, 75% of our black boys cannot pass standard reading and writing tests, a democratic state. Oh, Lord. So, yes, let's pay rest, 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 restoration. Read the, rest, read the, read the rest, restitution. Wait, wait, did this nigga, wait, this nigga said respiration? <laughs> hold on, I didn't care. Hold on. Rest, restoration. Let's, let's play restoration. <laughs> 
This mush mouth. Look at these inarticulate mush mouth Negroes. They go. Let's play respiration. I mean, um, restitution. I mean, ret um, um, reparation. Just mush mouth Negroes. State of California, 70, 75% of our black boys cannot pass standard reading and writing tests. A democratic state. So, yes, let's pay rest, 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 restoration. Let's pay <laughs> rest, restitution. How about the Democratic Party pay for all the misery brought to my race? And uh, those, after, after we learn our history, decide to uh, stay there, they, they should pay also. They're complicit. And every white American, Republican or Democrat, that feels guilty because of your white skin, you should need to pony up also. Oh, oh Lord. They didn't put that Negro. That's one of these Negroes they didn't put out there. All oh, poor white people. Oh, we're beating up on white people for asking for what we're owed. Oh, poor put upon white people. Oh, my God. Uh, how dare you do this to Massa, making Massa feel guilty just because of Massa skin. Oh, Lord Jesus. This is what they put out there. And remember, that whole committee, that subcommittee, that entire sub subcommittee is full of whites and immigrants. That whole subcommittee who put this whole farce and charade on, it's full of whites and immigrants. The only black person is Sheila Jackson Lee, and she's a damn immigrant. She's Jamaican, and they had a couple of Latinas on there, but everybody's white and, white and immigrant. So this whole civil rights subcommittee they ain't even got no foundation of black Americans on it. And this is why we got to be on top of our game. We should have been doing this a long time ago, looking out for ourselves. But let me play some of the other clips from this farce. This is um, Ty Nisi Coates, Danny Glover, and who is this other kid? And um, a little bit, of, I might play some Corey Butt Cheeks. I don't know. But here's Ty Nisi Coates. I cited civil rights legislation yesterday, as well he should because he was alive to witness the harassment, jailing, and betrayal of those responsible for that legislation by a government sworn to protect them. The matter of reparations is one of making amends and direct redress, but it is also a question of citizenship. In H.R. 40, this body has a chance to both make good on its 2009 apology for enslavement. Uh-uh. And see, this is the... <sighs> This whole truth and reconciliation, we're going to make a whole big deal out of apologizing. I don't give a damn about no apology. I, just give me some money. Give me what's owed to me. Give me mine. Give me what's owed to me. I don't need no damn apology. See, when, when black folks come around, then everybody starts talking about how you feel and emotions and all that. No, 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 no. Just, just. Let's break that cheddar off. Let's get that money flowing. And reject fair weather patriotism. Justice. And I know, uh, everybody, again, and I, I didn't play the, the part where he was talking about, even he was talking about, well, we, it doesn't have to be checks in the form of payments. It could be blah, blah. No. No, we need the check. We need money. We need payments. We need cash. I want the cash. I want the gold. Give me the gold. I don't want to hear all that stuff. And now we got Danny Glover. I don't know what Danny Glover was talking about. He was all in, he was in the color purple mode. I don't know what Danny was. He was babbling through the whole thing. I don't know what Danny, nobody knew what the hell Danny was talking about. Bless his heart. And I think there was some pictures of Danny Glover. He had dozed off. I'm like, if y'all don't get this man some warm milk and let him take a nap, what are y'all doing with him out here? This is a shit show. But he, here he is. Here's Danny Glover. I don't know what he's talking about. For black people will not flow into society merely from court decisions, nor from fountains of political oratory. The fuck nor he will about? a few token changes quell all the temptations, oh, yearnings to fight. of millions of disadvantaged black my people. Daddy, I had to fight my White uncles. White America must recognize I had to fight that my justice brothers. for black people cannot be achieved without radical changes in the structure I of our never society. thought I had to fight in my own house. <laughs> I love Hoppo. God knows I do. <laughs> but I kill him dead before I let him beat me. 
Get off my I land! Get off my <laughs> land! Seely! Seely! God damn, Danny. I don't know what Danny was talking about. Yeah, it just felt like I'm watching the color purple shit. I don't know what this nigga was talking about. Damn. This thing was just a hot goddamn mess. Just all of it. Just a mess from top to bottom, man. And then Corey butt cheeks. What are you talking about? time we find the common ground and the common purpose to deal with the ugly past and make sure that generations ahead do not have to continue to mark disparities, but can truly talk about a nation where, as our ancestors spoke from the good book, where justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Oh, shut up, Corey. Shut your ass up. Uh, so, they were, this, they were just doing a whole mashup. Of, let me put my Mac and music on. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. They were just, that, this is what it was about. All this just nonstop babbling, talking in circles, trying to be all poetic, never getting to the point. And that was by design. The whole design of this was to just be confusing, as unfocused, as nonspecific as possible. This whole thing was all about being nonspecific and just all over the place. That was by design. But what really a lot of folks are talking about, this one guy, this Coleman Hughes. Now, he really put the syrup on the butter biscuits. This guy, Coleman Hughes, and nobody knew who the hell he was. He just some random Negro who's some freelance writer. I mean, just completely an, an obscure Negro who nobody knows. I mean, they could have had so many other qualified people there. You could have had Brother Claude Anderson, anybody from the Hidden Color series. There were so many other people they could have had up there to really articulate this matter and just get right to the point. But it's it's not about getting to the point and making sense. That would be too much like right. There's a reason why they got Danny Glover and all of these damn mush mouths out here. They don't want to make it an articulate conversation. This is why we have to stay on the grind as far as that. This is why we have to stay on the grind. There's some people, how come you didn't go up there? Man, they wouldn't let me, uh, if I went up there, they wouldn't let me in that damn building. Y'all know good and well they wouldn't let me in that building. Because let me tell you something, I'd get a check that day. I'd be up there getting right to the damn point. I'd be up there, I'd come out with a check for y'all ass that day. I wouldn't be playing at all. I ain't going up there talking about my damn feelings. I wouldn't leave that building until somebody gave me some money. I know how to get some fucking money. Ain't no, they better not let me up in that bitch. I'm getting you some money, y'all. I'm like Johnny Cochran. Johnny Cochran, he, he got some shit done. Johnny Cochran will get the gold. I'm going to get you some money. Let me get up there talking. I ain't leaving that building until I get a check from for somebody. I'm going to get right to the point. Well, how you feel? How would Jesus do? Jesus told me to come get this money from your ass. That's what Jesus told me. Now, do I get the checks on the first or the second floor? Because they look like they got checks on the, on the first floor. So which elevator do I take to go down to the check place? Because I ain't here for no feelings, talking about no damn, no Jesus and no Kumbaya. I ain't here for no minority coalition. I ain't here for none of that. I'm not here to talk about how bad racism is. You know what it is. It's payday time right now. We, we need an emergency fund right now. I need it right now so I can go take it to, to the people who need it the most. We need a justice reparations fund right now. I'm not here to play games. I wouldn't spend five minutes talking in circles about my damn feelings. We about to talk business. It's business time. But this one dude, Coleman Hughes, he was really throwing them butter biscuits all up in the air. And let me play this guy. And a lot of people were very critical of him. They were booing his ass in the whole nine yards. Where's this Negro? All right. And by the way, this dude is a Democrat. Now, this is a Democratic coon. All right. This guy is a Democrat. This just shows you the vitriol the Democrats have for us. And by the way, when you hear people like this, when you hear Negroes like this being placed in certain positions to speak on important issues, 
always understand that it's the white supremacists talking and this is just their Negro puppet. Let's never forget that. Let's always keep that in mind. Understand that it's the white supremacists who's putting this Negro out to speak for them. That's why he's such a random unknown Negro that don't nobody know. It's the white supremacists putting their bought and paid for Negro out here. So this is Coleman Hughes. Mr. Coleman Hughes is a columnist for Quillette and has worked as a freelance opinion writer since January 2018. He's had pieces published in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the National Review, the City Journal, and the Spectator. He's studying philosophy at Columbia University, and we appreciate your attendance, and you're recognized for five minutes, sir. Thank you, Chairman Cohen, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the committee. It's an honor to testify on a topic as important as this one. Nothing I'm about to say is meant to minimize the horror and brutality of slavery and Jim Crow. Racism is a bloody stain on this country's history, and I consider our failure to pay reparations directly to freed slaves after the Civil War to be one of the greatest injustices ever perpetrated. Oh, now catch that now. I want y'all to notice something. Notice they said he, he writes for the National Review. So this, this is some white supremacist think tank that has written all of the talking points for him, okay? So all of his talking points are written by white supremacist think tanks. Now, you heard what he just said. It's horrible that they didn't give black people reparations right after slavery, as if it's just too late now. And it's not too late. It's never too damn late by the US government. But I worry that our desire to fix the past compromises our ability to fix the present. Think about what we're doing today. We're spending our time debating a bill that mentions slavery 25 times, but incarceration only once, in an era with no black slaves, but nearly a million black prisoners. A bill that doesn't mention homicide once, at a time when the Center for Disease Control reports homicide as the number one cause of death for young black men. I'm not saying that acknowledging history doesn't matter. It does. I'm saying there's a difference between acknowledging history and allowing history to distract us from the problems we face today. In 2008, the House of Representatives formally apologized for slavery and Jim Crow. In 2009, the Senate did the same. Black people don't need another apology. We need safer neighborhoods and better schools. We need a less punitive criminal justice system. Oh, Lord, that criminal justice system BS, which gives the impression that all black people are criminals. See, whenever it talks about we're going to help black people with criminal justice reform, but that gives the assumption that we're all criminals. It's white supremacist talking points always catch that. We need affordable health care. And none of these things can be achieved through reparations for slavery. Yes, they can. They're booing him. Nearly everyone close to me, nearly everyone close to me told me not to testify today. They told me that even though I've only ever voted for Democrats, I'd be perceived as a Republican and therefore hated by half the country. Others told me that by distancing myself from Republicans, I would end up angering the other half of the country. And the sad truth is that they were both right. That's how suspicious we've become of one another. That's how divided we are as a nation. If we were to pay reparations today, we would only divide the country further. Oh, stop. This is this whole, we're going to make white people uncomfortable. That, here, that's that cone babble. We just going to make white people uncomfortable. We're going to divide it. We're already divided. These people are blowing our brains out in the damn streets, nigga making it harder to build the political coalitions. Oh, that coalition, they uh, divided coalition. They got them using all those coon buzzwords. The coal, we ain't no damn coalition. Ain't no coalition. We ain't got no coalition. Don't nobody want no coalition with us. We've been doing the coalition thing for the last 100 years. It hasn't worked. It's all about us right now. Ain't no more damn coalitions required to solve the problems facing black people today. We would insult many black Americans by putting a price on the suffering of their ancestors. No, you wouldn't. 
They booing and his we ass. Would turn the They're booing him. No, you're not going to insult me. Insult if you're going to insult me, insult me. Then give me a good price. Insult me. Putting a price on the suffering of the answer. No, that's not going to insult me. That's going to respect our legacy. Relationship between Black Americans and White Americans from a coalition into a transaction. What coalition? This nigga keeps talking about a damn coalition. There is no coalition. Black folks don't have time to wait on no coalition from the dominant society. Some coalition that ain't never going to happen. If the coalition was going to happen, it would have happened already. It's a one-sided coalition. We're trying to appease every damn body. Ain't no coalition. Damn that. It's money time. Let's let's hand that bag over right now. Yes, let's get a transaction. Yes. That, let's correlate that. That's going to be our coalition. Let's make that transaction. That's the only relationship we do need to have, a transactional relationship. That's the only relationship they have with us. Unless we're giving them money or spending money on something that they have, they don't want to deal with us. They don't come around us unless they're making money off of us. Nobody comes around us unless they're exploiting us financially. Our presence here has always been transactional. Slavery was transactional. They made money off of us. Give me some of that damn money back that you made off of us, nigga. From a union between citizens into a lawsuit between plaintiffs and defendants. What we should do is pay reparations to black Americans who actually grew up under Jim Crow and were directly harmed by second class citizenship. People like my grandparents. No, people like us. Jim Crow was just the name of public policies. Jim Crow was the name of public policies, of common law. We're under a Jim Crow style system now. We're under a Jim Crow system now. And now, it's worse than Jim Crow. More black people get killed now by race soldiers and state-sponsored vigilantes than Jim Crow. More black people have been killed in the last few years than the entire Jim Crow era. We need that paper. But paying reparations to all descendants of slaves is a mistake. Take me, for example. I was born three decades after the end of Jim Crow into a privileged household in the suburbs. I attend an Ivy League school, yet I'm also descended from slaves who worked on Thomas Jefferson's Monticello plantation. So reparations for slavery would allocate federal resources to me, but not to an American with the wrong ancestry, even if that person is living paycheck to paycheck and working multiple jobs what the hell do you mean the wrong ancestor? What he's trying to say is immigrants. Oh, he's trying to say immigrants. It would a person who has the wrong ancestry. He means immigrants. And immigrants, that don't have nothing to do with the debt that's owed to us. They need to take that up with their home country. See, watch this dude. To support a family. You might call that justice. I call it justice for the dead at the price of justice for the living. I understand that reparations are about what people are owed, regardless of how well they're doing. I understand that. But the people who are owed for slavery are no longer here, and we're not entitled to collect on their debts. Cool reparations, level. by definition, are only given to victims. So the moment you give me reparations, you've made me into a victim without my consent. Not just- Okay, what the hell, hold on. Let this phone ring, I thought your damn phone was off, hold on. Okay, when they start talking like that, just let them know. We are victims. See, that they try to shame you by talking that victim talk. Well, you, you're acting like a victim. Damn, you're acting like a victim. And you let them know, I am a victim. I'm a victim of white supremacy. Yeah, I have no problem with that. I am a victim. We are victims of white supremacy. I have no problem with that title whatsoever. I've been victimized by systematic white supremacy. I am a victim of white supremacy. We are victims. We're victimized now. We're under the threat of death Whenever we walk out of the house, we're under the threat of systematic death. 
Everywhere we go, when we walk out of the house, we have state-sanctioned terrorists working for the government who can kill us with impunity. We're under the threat of murder with impunity every single day, and these people are incentivized to kill us, harm us, disenfranchise us. We're under the threat of unemployment, gentrification. We're under the threat of harm on a daily basis. We are victimized on a daily basis. We are victims. You're not going to shame me. That don't, you're a victim. You're a victim. Yeah, I am, nigga. I am a victim. Yes, I am. See, they try to go after your ego. Why don't you stop being a victim? Well, why don't you stop being a victimizer? But yeah, we are victims. 100% victims. Just that, you've made one third of black Americans who poll against reparations into victims without their consent. And black Americans have fought too long for the right to define themselves to be spoken for in such a condescending manner. The question is not what America owes me by virtue of my ancestry. The question is what all Americans owe each other by, by virtue of being citizens of the same nation. And the obligation of citizenship is not transactional. It's not contingent yes, it on is. ancestry. Yes, it is. It never expires and it can't be paid off. Yes, it can. For all these reasons, Bill H.R. 40 is a moral and political mistake. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. They booing his ass. Chill, 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 chill. He was presumptive, but he still has a right to speak. Uh, Mr. Burgess Owens is recognized. Okay, so that's enough of that coon babble. Okay. Now, this, this dude, Coleman... Coleman Hughes, he mentioned that part of his family, come they came from the Thomas Jefferson plantation from Monticello. I don't know how true that is because I'm looking up some information about his dad. And his dad, his father may or may not have immigrant ancestry because his dad, his dad is named Dwayne Hughes. His dad is a lawyer out of New York and he does like public speaking too. He's with a, a whole bunch of these diversity black and brown coalition places out there in New York. His dad and I know his dad is from Ohio. His dad from since because I've been researching this Negro. His dad is from Ohio. but I, And his dad speaks fluent Spanish and Portuguese and all this stuff. So somebody in his dad's family, the dad's Somebody is a, is an immigrant on that dad side, but the dad has scrubbed the the internet of all information on him. I'm still researching that damn dad, but his mama, I didn't got on his mama's side. No, I didn't got all the information. This Coleman dude, this nigga's Puerto Rican. His full name is Coleman Cruz Hughes. So Coleman is actually Puerto Rican, and he identified as Puerto Rican for a long time. This nigga's Puerto Rican. So would this Negro even be eligible for reparations? Because I don't think he is. Definitely not on his mama's side, and I don't think he is on his dad's side. That whole, they can trace themselves back to the Thomas Jefferson plantation or trace some random relative. That's questionable. But this nigga's Puerto Rican. That nigga is Puerto Rican. And he is hidden that information deliberately. You see, this Negro shouldn't really even be speaking on reparation issues for foundational black Americans because his heritage is questionable. Just like Candace Owens, you know, she was they had her doing some kind of hearing, and she tried to talk about one of the relatives that came from a plantation, but up until a few years ago, Candace Owens, she would identify as Caribbean. We found old modeling pages of her where she classified herself as Caribbean, so she's always distanced herself from black Americans. But this Negro Coleman, not only is this Negro Puerto Rican, we got a video of this dude where he talks about how 
he stopped claiming Puerto Rican in order to finesse the whole black thing. I got a, I found a clip of this dude where he's talking about how you know him claiming Puerto Rican that that don't even really work for him. He finds he can really come up harder and better on just claiming black because see he's one of these little Afro Latino Negroes and they you know he he ain't really got too much stock into the Latino world the 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 anti-black racism is just as prevalent there you ain't getting nothing out of them but his name is Coleman Cruz but I want y'all to listen to this clip of this Negro this is from a little while back he was on here on some little live stream with some other um, black female immigrant she's Jamaican so listen to this dude in his own words this is the Coleman Hughes dude in his own words listen to this hold on Uh, I think over time I started calling myself black rather than half Puerto Rican half black not consciously or intentionally but it just happened and I think in retrospect the reason I started doing that seems to me to be because there's much more to be gained in terms of social capital by calling yourself black. There's a, you're allowed to. That's the him in his own words, family. This is this Negro in his own words. You see, this is what they do. These immigrant coons come over and they, they say, well, look, I can finesse the game by just kind of blending in and just being regular black. Let me, let me, On the surface. Now at home, I have disdain for other black folks, but on the surface, socially, I can gain more by just, you know, acting black and just claiming black publicly. This is his own words, finessing. This is how they finesse. I can gain more just by claiming black. You see the the type of deceptive sambos that they get out here? Yeah, I get more social capital by just being. Let me let me drop the whole Puerto Rican thing because I, I need to blend in with these Negroes so I can finesse and get and get everything that's supposed to come to them, and then undermine these Negroes after I didn't went in and finessed and pretended to be one of them. So this right here shows that he doesn't really identify with us. He had to come to terms and learn how to finesse to identify with us more to be gained in terms of social capital by calling yourself black there's a you're allowed to uh, how do i put it um you, you don't you don't see as much hispanic identity politics there's there's less to be gained from emphasizing the half puerto rican side of oneself mm. he said there is less to be gained it's all about a come up This thing is all about a finesse with them, guys. It's all about a come up and finesse with these folks, man. We are their come up. This is why we got to watch these little Negroes who slither around and they start getting on the coon train. These little Afro-Latino Negroes who slither around. You understand? He's an opportunist, just like Candace Owens. That's another one of these Caribbean coon opportunists. Remember, Candace Owens was running around with the NAACP suing people for racism, and then she's out here running around talking about ain't no racism, give me some money. So anywhere where there's some butter biscuits, that's where they're going to go. Anywhere where there's butter biscuits, that's where they'll go, just so they can get butter biscuits for themselves. You understand? But these Negroes are hella slick. But understand, the white supremacists props them up. We got to understand that the white supremacists are the ones who prop these Negroes up. We can never forget that. And we have to continue to drive the narrative for reparations. And I, I talked about this on Twitter. I was breaking some stuff down. I gave 11 points that we need to make about re- reparations. And I want to go over those real quick. There's 11 points that we have to go over when it comes to to reparations. And we have to drive the point home. See, the thing is, we don't we we don't have to worry about talking in circles and 
dealing with the irrational logic of the white supremacists. We, we don't, we shouldn't waste time on that. We waste way too much time on that. White supremacy is an illogical thing by definition. So wasting a lot of time with these white supremacists and what they don't like and their dumbass excuses. We need to knock those things out of the water real quick and stay focused and stay on the path. And when they start talking and using the same dumbass talking points, because see, it's very difficult to logically refute why black people need reparations. They've given reparations to so many other people. No other group in the history of mankind, and I'm telling you this, deserves reparations more than foundational black Americans. What we've gone through, what we've accomplished, creating the wealth of an entire nation and being brutalized in the process and nonstop brutalization afterwards that has never ceased and we've never been compensated for it. No one on the planet deserves reparations more than foundational black Americans and everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. So what happens is they start deliberately talking dumb. Notice they're their talking points are just dumb. One of the first talking points is, well, I never owned slaves, so I'm not responsible. Well, the problem with that is slavery, it was sanctioned by the federal government. So all that, I'm not individually responsible. No, 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 no. You are subject to the government. The government kept us enslaved, kept my people enslaved. The government profited off of it. We couldn't get out of slavery because of the government. The government was militarily back, so if we tried to run away, they would catch catch us and beat us and put us back in slavery. The government and the whole system was a part of that damn government. So the government, which you are sanctioned under, profited from free black labor. They accumulated all that wealth and passed that wealth down and that wealth has been compounded over and over again. And we're owed some of that wealth. Number two, another BS excuse they use, well, well, I'm Irish. So am I owed reparations? My people were enslaved over here too, the whole Irish slave garbage. Well, number one, Irish people, a few of them were indentured servants and those indentured servants they got what's called freedom dues. They did get a form of payment. They didn't leave them ass out. They got freedom dues which was money, guns and land. So they actually got double reparations because after you got your freedom dues you were still allowed to amalgamate into white society and get all the benefits and the goodies of being white like free land, like the Homestead Act, preferential jobs, preferential living space. So the Jim Crow era was one long, big affirmative action plan for white people. So you did get your own. And also just by you coming over here by choice, That was a come up because over in Ireland, y'all were living like fucking flies. Y'all were broke, starving, dusty, full of head lice, eating potatoes. So you're welcome. Now, what uh, another thing they like to say. Number three. How would we determine who qualifies for reparations? It's, It's just so confusing. That whole, we don't know how to figure it out. And that's a, that's another con game. They know how to figure it out. They knew how to figure out who the Native Americans were. They know how to, they, they created a doll's rose in order to figure out who were, were the Native Americans, what tribe they came from. And, and unfortunately, a lot of white people would pay to get on that Indian roll. They would pay $5 to get on the doll's rolls to have them write down that they were Native American. That's why you got so many phony, fake-ass, 
white people pretending to be Native Americans today. They Their family finessed the dolls' roles. And that's one thing we got to watch out for. Because if there's a some type of census or national role that we have to get on, watch out for the damn Rachel Dolezals. Watch out for the Rachel Dolezals out there, guys. Because they're going to be popping up out the woodworks. They gonna be popping up out the woodworks. You better watch out for them. Yeah, those Elizabeth Warrens and all these people. All of a sudden, you're gonna see a lot of um, um, mayonnaise and kente cloths. You're gonna see a lot of mayonnaise smelling kente cloths out there. But it's easy to find out who's owed reparations if you can trace your family back to a plantation then you you can qualify. It's just that simple. It's not hard. It's not hard to figure out. And that's fairly easy to trace your family back to a plantation or the early census rolls because a lot of black people are on the 1870 census. That's when they started to take the census for a lot of black people starting in around 1870. So if you can trace your family back to those 1870 census rolls, well, most likely you qualify. You did So it's not it's not rocket science. They got all these 23 and me and all of these. They got all types of stuff where they can trace you back. They can trace your ass back to what tribe you came from if they wanted to. I, I would don't let the, the white supremacists try to play dumb and naive. I don't know how how, how am I gonna find you? They got all types of records of an enslaved African people. I think there's a national registry also in Washington, D.C. I got to look into that, too. Now, number four, one thing they like to say, well, why am I responsible for the sins of my forefathers? Why am I being punished for the sins of my forefathers? See, they love to praise their forefathers when it's convenient. They love to brag about what their forefathers did when it's convenient. But then you want to run away from all that exploitation your forefathers did. Your forefathers profited for their sins. And the profits for the sins, they were passed down generationally to you. And these white supremacists, they've racially locked in all those profits away from black people. Now it's time to unlock some of that. I don't care about the sins of your fathers, the profits he made from those sins. See, I don't care about the sin part. See, they like to talk about the sins and the moral. Damn that. The profit that he made from the sin. That's what I'm talking about. All that damn money they made in slavery. They built an empire off our damn backs and passed it down to you. That money didn't go nowhere. That money is still here and we want it. And we got to be bold about it. And number five, they like to say, well, how would we possibly distribute payments for reparations? I mean, just the distribution would be just impossible. No, it wouldn't. It's not impossible when you're distributing the payments to the Japanese. It's not impossible when you're distributing the payments to the Native Americans or all that money y'all sent over to Israel. It's not impossible then. You can send that money the way y'all send court orders. Y'all know how to distribute warrants, court orders, child support notices. Y'all know how to distribute everything else to us. Y'all can get everything else to us when you need to get it to us. You can get my check to me very easy. Send it to my damn house. That's how. The hell you mean how you going to do? How we going to do? I just we just don't know. It's just just so impossible. No. Y'all be sending niggas Equifax bills. Fucked up credit scores. Y'all send everything else to us easily. You can send that damn check. Just like you send everything else. Real simple, in the mail. On the first. That's how you, direct deposit. I take direct deposit. Motherfucker, I take PayPal. 
Cash App, how you want to do it. Y'all can send a repo letter to a nigga real fast, but now you don't know how to send that paper. No, no, no. Get that paper to me. You know how to do it. Now, number six. Well, what about immigrant groups who came over after slavery? They were mistreated, too. That's that Mitch McConnell. He was talking that. He was talking about what about immigrants? What about them? They ain't got nothing to do with us. Immigrant groups don't have nothing to do with a debt that's owed to us. They have zero to do with it. Well, they be struggling. Well, damn it. If they weren't struggling that hard, they wouldn't come over here. They came here voluntarily. If it gets so bad, they can go back home. This is our home. Ain't no go back to Africa. No, no, no. This is our home here. We don't have a home in Africa. We don't. This is our home here. We don't have nowhere to go back to. This is our place right here that we built. Because understand this, nobody brought us to America. Because I've heard people try to use those terms. But when, when black people were brought to America, no, we were never brought to America. There was no America when we got here. We built America. We came to a damn wilderness. What nothing here. We built America. Always remember that. They didn't bring us to no damn America. We built America. Always get that clear. We were the only people that didn't get brought to America. We built the damn place. This is our home. We have more entitlement to this home than anybody because we built the damn home. All these other people immigrated from somewhere. We did not. And even the white ones, because they'll try to use that whole, well, I'm, I'm Russian, and I came over after slavery, so none of my people were slave owners, but damn it, you came over from Russia because it wasn't popping over there, and you heard about all the goodies that was generated by free black labor, Dorkachev or whatever your name is, and then you hopped on a boat and came over here and enjoyed all the goodies that were generated from free labor. You owe two. So have you some Russian vodka and let's get that check popping. And then the next one, number seven, they say, well, oh my God, there are no slaves alive today. Nobody's a victim of slavery today. That's just like what that coon was talking about in the video. In order to justify enslaving people, a culture of anti-black racism had to be created. And they put that culture of anti-black racism, they put that culture in every area of activity. Everything we do as far as people activity is dominated by anti-black racism. Everything. We can't do anything that is not already poisoned by anti-black racism in this global society. Not just here, but just in global society, but specifically here. And that anti-black racism has been passed down today. That anti-black racism is still here. And understand, they didn't end slavery Slavery never ended. White supremacy is slavery. Always keep that in mind. Now, number eight, and this plays off number seven. Number eight, they'll say, well, slavery was so long ago. Why are we worrying about ancient history? It was a million. They always make it farther and farther away. It was two million years ago. My God. Slavery was eight billion years ago. Why are we still talking about it? It was a trillion years ago. It was so long ago. And we have to remind them, look, you still had black American slaves, people who were bought and sold before the Civil War, still walking around here in the 60s and 70s. One of the last known 
black people who was enslaved, who was verifiably sold on a plantation before the Civil War, brother named Sylvester McGee. This brother died in 1971. Remember, a lot of these brothers and sisters who were enslaved, a lot of them were, they lived to be old. See, the thing about slavery, we think that all the enslaved African people were just eating pig feet and chitlins and all that, just eating the slave, the, the typical slave diet. That's not true in all cases. There were a lot of black people who knew how to live off the earth. They knew how to use herbs. A lot of black people back then were herbalists to a certain degree. Also, even if you know, if you got grandparents, if you were old enough to have old grand, like my grandmother was old. My grandmother was born in 1910, but my grandmother had a garden. I remember my grandmother would have a garden. She'd be in her garden all the time. So old black folks were, a lot of them were surprisingly healthy. A lot of black folks Don't think that everybody was eating them chitlins and pig feet. A lot of black people knew how to grow their own food. A lot of them were very were surprisingly healthy in many parts of the country. They knew how to grow their own food and eat off the earth, and they knew how to make home remedies, and they knew how to how to heal themselves. A lot of black people knew how to heal themselves. That's why you go a lot of them old black folks. You go to them, and they'll give you some kind of elixir. Some kind of concoction. If you're sick, and it'll knock that sickness right up out of you. Yeah, they be having turpentine and wheat berry, and they be having all this stuff. Yeah, a lot of those old black people were herbalists. They understood hoodoo and all this stuff. So a lot of them were surprisingly healthy, and a lot of them lived to be old as hell. Castor oil, yeah. A lot of them lived to be very, very old. So this brother, they said he was like 130 years old. And they 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 had documents. They there was a a bill of sale for this guy they found at like the the, the library down there in Mississippi. They're showing that verified that this dude was sold and they showed that he actually fought in the Civil War. They had all of his information. Yeah, man, it's real heavy. But, yeah, some of these brothers and sisters from slavery were living into the 60s and 70s. So that's in our lifetime. So this don't let them, don't make them, let these people make you think this is some kind of ancient history. Slavery wasn't that damn long ago. We still feel the effects of that. We still feel the effects of it to this day. Now, number nine some more BS they like to spew. Well, why should my tax dollars pay for something that I didn't do? The same way our tax dollars go to pay Japanese. I didn't put no Japanese people in an internment camp. I didn't kill any Native Americans, but my tax dollars still go to them. I didn't do anything to anybody in Israel or anybody in the Holocaust, but my tax dollars go to Israel. I didn't do anything to the World Trade Center, but our tax dollars go to the victims of 9-11. You understand? So our tax dollars go to a lot of people and to a lot of things that we didn't have anything to do with, but it goes to them. This bailout that they're about to do with the farmers. I didn't do anything to these damn farmers that they're about to use all this money to bail them out. You understand? Now, number 10, and this was Mitch McConnell. Let me see if I could find Mitch McConnell's talking about reparations real quick. Let me see if I could find that clip. Hold on one second. I want to find that because he was, oh, he, he had disdain in his voice when he was talking about reparations. Okay, I think this is it right here. Uh, okay, let me see if this is it right here. A big hearing on Capitol Hill will raise the issue of reparations for slavery. This on Juneteenth, the day commemorating the end of slavery in the U.S. Hold Chief on, hold Congressional on, hold on. Correspondent Mayor Bruce is, is okay, there covering. Okay, hold on. Deal with our original, okay, hold on. you know, tried. Hold on. Nation referencing President Obama. Take a listen. We've 
you know, tried to deal with our original sin of slavery by fighting a civil war, by passing uh, landmark civil rights legislation. Uh, we've elected an African-American president. Mitch McConnell went on to reference the fact that no one currently okay. alive was responsible. For oh, he, he this is Mr. McConnell. He said that reparations was Obama. We elected a black president. So that's reparations right there. That just illogical um, plantation master babble, mayonnaise babble. That ain't nothing but mayonnaise babble right there. Talking about Obama was our reparations. Let me see if I got the whole clip of him doing all that explaining. Hold on, where's the whole clip? I want to find that whole clip. Where's that? Where's that clip? I be posting so much stuff on my social media. Hold on, let me see if I can find that. Okay, uh, one more, look one more time. Okay, I can't find it right now, and I don't want to waste time. Okay, I'm, I'm scrolling through all my stuff. Okay, now I can't find it. I, I can't find it right now. But he was talking about Obama being a form of reparations for us. And then he said, Civil War. That's, that gets me to number 10. The Civil War was reparations. And I broke down this Civil War garbage before. Number one, we all know. And the white supremacists know too. Let's be very clear. All of these dumbass talking points that they throw out, they know that it's a crock of BS, but the name of the game is to waste your time. The name of the game is to completely waste your time by, by white splaining and mayonnaise babbling and throwing out these talking points that's completely asinine and illogical so that you don't talk about things in a logical manner. Now, they understand that the Civil War had nothing to do with them giving a damn about in the, the enslavement of black people. The Civil War was about keeping the Union together. They tried to give the impression that white people in the North felt some kind of moral duty to fight to free black people in the South. And that is the biggest crock of BS ever. And they know it. The minute they announced the Civil War, white people in the North went around in the streets and started killing random black people in New York. Look up the draft riots. When these white people in the North found out they had to fight the Confederacy, they started to attack random black people. This was before the Civil War even started. And after the Civil War, these same white Union soldiers, these white people in the North, they committed a genocide out there in Mississippi at the Devil's Punch Bowl. They killed thousands of black people in a concentration camp that they never talk about in history down in not just Mississippi. They don't like to talk about that. It was a bunch of white Union soldiers who put black people in concentration camps and killed black people off by the thousands. Y'all look that up. Look up the Devil's Punch Bowl out there in not just Mississippi. And look up the draft riots in New York. Google all this stuff I'm talking. See, they don't teach y'all this. So don't ever let them run that game about the Civil War was about helping us and it was some damn reparations. They owe us three times for the Civil War. They owe us for slavery. They owe us for the damn draft riots. They owe us for that concentration camp down in Mississippi. They owe us for all of that. And remind them of that whenever they bring that up. That shuts them right the hell on up. I, I want them to bring up reparations. I'm going to talk about all the money they owe. Oh, repar okay, let's talk about all the paper. Since we got, we're going to talk about a concentration camp and how much money, no, let's talk about all of it. And number 11, finally, and, and let me get back to number 10 for before I get into number 11. And speaking of the Civil War, before I get to number 11, the Civil War, look, slavery was abolished by name. I want y'all to understand that. See, we got to look and see how this thing really is and not let the white supremacists control the narrative. We have to always control the narrative. 
that shows power. When you can control a narrative, that shows power. And what we're doing now with this whole reparations thing, we're showing power because we're maintaining the narrative. They're desperately trying to control the narrative, but we are controlling the narrative of this reparations con um, conversation. But slavery, they never got rid of slavery. They got rid of the name and then expanded slavery. They just got rid of the name slavery and expanded the practice of slavery. So what they did in 1865, instead of just relegating slavery to plantations, they said, hey, we got to make the entire society a plantation. So we don't have to have these little bitty borders here and there. No. We are going to make society a plantation. And the prisons, that's going to be greater confinement. See, we just think it's just the prison. No, they decided to make all of society the plantation. So they created all those black codes. So your blackness is going to be the prison. Your prison is going to be your skin color. So no matter where you go, you're in prison. You can run, you can hide, you can make however amount of money you want to make, but you're still in prison. And in prison, we can do anything to a prisoner. We can beat you, maim you, lynch you, rob you, which is what they did to free black people. That's why all the lynchings happened after slavery. Do y'all know that? Most of the lynchings happened after slavery. Because see, on the plantation, when you could buy and sell a black person, the plantation owner would give you a certain level of protection from outside society. So you only had to deal really with that one slave master. You understand? But when you're outside the confines of just that one plantation, now you're in a whole society where everybody is a threat to you. See, we have to look at it like that and that's how it is then, that's how it was then and that's how it is now. We're in a global prison. This is why Neely Fuller talks about white supremacy as a global prison. So when you go out, we talk about how much money we make, how educated we are, and these race soldiers can come and gun us down anywhere we are. Because our skin is the prison. Now, that doesn't make it bad. See, we, we think, okay, damn, white society has deemed our skin color a bad thing, so we must be bad people. So we internalize what they project onto us, but that's their insecurity. See, this is how we got to look at it. They're wrong, not you. See, this is what turns people into coons. You think, okay, something's wrong with me, therefore something's wrong with other black folks, so I need to appease white people. When you do that, no. You hustling backwards. You can never appease them. You're going to run yourself ragged. This is why you always have to work to destroy the system of white supremacy and replace it with justice. You got to be bold all the time. You always got to ride on them. You always got to bang on them. You're never supposed to be comfortable with these white supremacists. White supremacy is ungodly. You can't say that you believe in a higher being and you try to go along to get along with these damn white supremacists in their system. No, no, they have the problem. They have the problem. They are the people who are sick mentally and physically. I saw some footage of the Trump rally. He had a Trump rally down there. He just announced his, his, his campaign down in Florida. And they were, a lot of these white supremacists were going down there. And a lot of people were making jokes and memes about some of the video footage because some of these people were coming from these little, you know, these little white supremacist enclaves all around the country. Shout out to Realist Talk for the, the Melanoid donation. Shout out to that brother. But 
some of these people were showing up to that Trump rally. Some of these white supremacists look half damn dead. You see how sickly and weird they look? They look horrible. And we were just in Vegas. Me and the family went to Vegas for Father's Day. I took the family to Vegas. We drove from California to Vegas. And you know, on the way to Vegas, if you're living in if you live in California, you you got these little hick towns. And in many states around the country, outside of the major cities, if you go outside into some of these little hick towns, these people it, it looks like the hills have eyes. There's always these weird ass white supremacists lurking around these places. And, and I talked about this the other day on my live stream. We stopped in Baker, not Bakersville, but I think this town was Baker, California. One of these little places we were driving and we stopped by a gas station and this on the way to Vegas. You know, it's one of these places where it's like one gas station, one McDonald's. So we go to the McDonald's and it's full of people, suspected white supremacists, and it smelled horrible. We went in there and it just smelled absolutely horrible. The customers stank, the employees stank, everybody was stinking. And me and my wife were looking at each other, kind of holding our noses. It wasn't Bakersville. No, it was Baker. It wasn't Bakersville. It's Baker, California. Yeah, kind of going toward that that Barstow area, these little hick places. But the they were stinking and their teeth were rotten. Everybody had these rotten fucking teeth and they were funky. That old mayonnaise, musty, wet pet smell. It smelled like death. Oh, these people smell sick. And they live in these little old segregated white supremacist enclaves and they, they're all inbred. Y- you understand? These people are dying off. You can smell the damn death in these white supremacists. You can smell it on them. So I don't... I don't internalize the garbage that they try to project onto us. Yeah, a lot of them on them on the narcotics. And yeah, we got the food. We didn't really want the food. We lost our appetite. We we lost our appetite. We didn't really want to eat the food. It's the people smell so bad in there. We we lost our appetite. I got a damn snicker from the gas station next door. I didn't really want to eat the McDonald's. It smelled horrible. But Travel through middle America, some of these little places where they done ran all the black folks out, all these little old white supremacist enclaves. So y'all don't really go there because, you know, they done ran all the black folks out and we ain't got no business being there. But just stopping through some of these places, you got some of the most weirdo looking ass people imaginable who just look like death. You don't sit up here internalizing the garbage that they project onto you. You dig? But let me go to number 11. A lot of people will use this excuse and this guy, Coleman Hughes, he used this excuse when he was doing his his talk at the hearing. They'll say something like, well, reparations talk will make white people uncomfortable. And that's a kicker right there. Because black people, we've been programmed to go out of our way to not make white people uncomfortable. We cannot make Lord Jesus. We can't make Missy and Massa mad. Lord Jesus, you can't be mad. You ain't mad, is you? I sorry, Massa. See, we got that mentality. We have this thing where we feel like we have to tiptoe and walk on eggshells so they won't be uncomfortable. And reparations talk will make them uncomfortable. 
just like the dude in the video said. Well, that's going to make people feel, white people feel this way. Yes, reparations talk makes white people feel uncomfortable. This is the thing. I don't give a shit. I don't give a damn how uncomfortable people in the dominant society feels. This ain't about feelings. They feel uncomfortable just about our damn existence. I don't give a damn about how uncomfortable somebody feel about me getting justice. If you feel uncomfortable about me getting justice, I can give less than a shit about you. You know what else is uncomfortable? Slavery. Being sold is uncomfortable. Being raped by a plantation owner is uncomfortable. Being buck broken by a plantation owner is uncomfortable. Getting your ass whooped because you didn't pick enough cotton is uncomfortable. Getting your foot cut off because you didn't pick enough tobacco is uncomfortable. Jim Crow was uncomfortable. Lynching was uncomfortable. Gentrification is uncomfortable. Racially based mass incarceration is uncomfortable. State sanctioned police vigilante murder is uncomfortable there's a lot of stuff that's uncomfortable that we gotta go through every damn day I don't give a shit if a white supremacist is upset because I'm getting justice fuck him black folks y'all. that's one thing y'all better learn how not to give a damn about a white supremacist feelings that slave talk worrying about how the hell they feel so the hell what they already punishing us just for existing. No matter how nice you are, you go in there nice, buck dancing, tap dancing, smiling, grinning, and they still sit them here calling the police on you. Claiming to be uncomfortable. Damn that. Give me my money. I want a transactional relationship. Yes, like that nigga said. We, we, we're we going to mess up the coalitions and it's just going to be a transactional relationship. You damn right. You better believe I want a transactional relationship. That's all I want. Give me my money. And truth be told, that's the mentality I have now. I don't, look, I don't really want to be friends with anybody in the dominant society if they're not helping me produce justice. I don't believe in having friends who's not helping me produce justice. If you are in the dominant society and you're not helping me produce justice, I don't want to be your friend. Do y'all understand me? I don't want to be your friend if you're not helping me produce justice. The greatest sin in human history is happening right now, which is systematic white supremacy and anti-black racism. What the hell am I hanging around with you in the dominant society for if you ain't helping me produce justice? If you're not helping me, I'm not trying to be buddy, buddy and caca and kiki and with you. The fuck I want to hang with you for and you ain't helping me produce justice. And if we hang around, we, we better have a transactional relationship. We're making some kind of money. We're doing some kind of business and that's helping me produce justice because it's empowering me. But I don't sit around lollygagging, cockeying, and kikiing, and all this shit with folks in the dominant society if they ain't talking about producing justice. If I'm around some people in the dominant society and they start getting on some white supremacist denial stuff, well, um, well, you know, I don't know, man. If, if the, the guy just the guy who got shot, now, I don't think it's about race. He he he. If he just complied, ah, I ain't hanging with you. Some of y'all are laying up with some of these damn white supremacists. You in a, you all up in the bedroom with them and they ain't producing no bit of justice and you ain't getting them to. Yeah, the minute I get around somebody in the dominant society and they're talking all that low-key white supremacist bullshit, we, we have nothing to do with each other. The fuck I want to be your friend for? I got lifelong work to do your life's mission as mine is my life's mission 
is to find ways to produce justice, to reduce, to replace the system of white supremacy with justice. That's my life's mission. We got to wake up every day with that being our focal point. We got to wake up every day with that being the focal point. See, too many of us, we get up trying to figure out how to coon, how to throw another black person under the bus, how to buck dance, how to be the next bed wench or mammy for some damn body. See, a lot of us have that mentality. And that's a problem. That's a major problem. Speaking of mammy, y'all know that Jamel Hill, she did some shit that I really, really don't respect. You know, LeVar Ball, he was on ESPN and he had some little banter with this white female host, Molly, I think that's her name, Molly something. I don't watch sports. I don't know about all this stuff. I don't know these people's names. The ESPN said they just announced today that they're not going to have him on the show because of something inappropriate he said. Now, he made a comment to this lady, and Jamel Hill immediately immediately made a tweet talking about Oh my God, LeVar Ball was so inappropriate. Shout out to Molly for keeping her composure with such, well, I'm, I'm going to read her exact quote. Kudos to Molly Quirim, whatever her name is, for the professional way she handled LeVar Ball after his inappropriate comment. Maybe ESPN will finally have learned its lesson about putting him on TV. Now, Jamel Hill said this a couple of days ago. And... Today, ESPN said they're not going to have LeVar Ball on there. Now, they don't like LeVar Ball because he's very outspoken. He's very bold. Now, this is what he said. I want to play you what they said was inappropriate. This is on some I'm white and I say so. But this is what he said that was inappropriate. Listen to this. Hold on. LeVar, can I switch gears with you? for? Because I have a question you here. You can switch gears with me anytime. Let's stay oh focused Lord. here. All right. Um, can you please explain to me what the biggest... Go ahead. Go LeVar, can... That was it right there, guys. That was the inappropriate comment right there. That was it right there. Some of y'all might be like, what the hell? Let me play it again. That's that... She said, well, look, LeVar, they were talking about sports. She's like, well, can I... Look, can I switch gears with you for one second? He's like, yeah, you can switch gears with me anytime. And she kind of l- looked up you're like, oh, cool. okay, let's stay focused. She had the little white victim look in her eye. He's like, yeah, let's shift gears. So they made that into some sexual innuendo, which I don't, the dude wasn't making no damn sexual in you, but that they got black dick on the brain all the time. Anything we do, they got black dick on. Yeah, y'all missed it. Let me play it again. That was the inappropriate comment right there. They used some, oh, I'm white and I say so. She went into victim mode, rolling her eyes like, oh, Oh, my God. And she's married to what? Ain't she married to a ball player, Jalen Rose or somebody? So she threw the white victim look on her face. L- look. LeVar, can I switch gears with you? for? Because I have a question here. You can here. switch gears with me anytime. <laughs> Let's stay oh focused Lord. here. All right. Um, can you please explain? But you can switch gears with me anytime. So they didn't made that sexual. I don't know how they made that sexual. Yeah, she's married to Jalen Rowe. Uh, yeah. So, dude, they're trying to make it seem like, okay, the way they make it seem like he pulled this dick out and hit her in the head with it. The way they acting. So, she cheated on Jalen. Is that the chick who cheated on Jalen Rose? Wow. So, yeah, she's going to roll, kind of look up and roll her eyes like, oh, my God, my, my, my white pussy is in danger. Oh, no. And they use the I'm white and I say so. Now, ESPN said that was inappropriate. And they ain't going to have him on ESPN again because of that inappropriate comment. Now, Stephen A. Smith is a butter biscuit eating coon. When he saw the white woman roll her eyes, oh, oh my God, let's stay focused. And Stephen, oh, Lord, come on. Oh, come on now, Lord. His biscuits. 
Or he, Stephen was stays. He was saving himself. He saw that the white woman victim look in her eye. So Stephen knew that look. So he knew to to put some biscuits in the oven. The minute he saw that look, oh Lord Jesus, what what are you doing, Lord? That's the white woman over there. That is a white woman. What are you what are you saying now? I, that, that's why I don't fuck with sports. They treat these niggas like plantation coons, man. They treat these niggas like plantation coons, and none of them are, are bold enough to stand up to these folks and say, hey, y'all ain't going to do that to this guy. Hey, this thing might have a little racial undertone the way that y'all come in that dude. I can't respect that. I, 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 it, it, it hurts me to see grown old big niggas let these white supremacists just throw dirt on them and use I'm white and I say so to, to undermine them. And and Jamel Hill, that was a sucker move for her to basically give a wink and a nod to the white supremacists by saying, hey, look, I'll y'all, I'll let you use me to throw him under the bus. You can hide your little racism behind me. And Black Authority broke her ass down a few years ago her black anti-black male hatred. So he broke her shit down a long time ago. So she's she's campaigning to get a position somewhere. But it is what it is. But anyway, y'all, let me get up out of here, man. That's been today's episode of Tariq Radio. I've been on here for a minute. Been a long broadcast tonight. Anyway, man, Hidden Colors 5 in theaters all over the place August 1st go to hiddencolorsfilm.com to get your tickets that's in a month we got a month to go August 1st get your tickets hiddencolorsfilm.com go look and see which city it's going to be in near you and get your Hidden Colors 5 shirts also go to Tangible 2020 make a contribution to Tangibles 2020 because we're going to have to really push this Tangibles reparation movement we're going to have to do some some really hard campaigning we're going to have to put some more resources out here in the game and really get this message out there guys because these people are going to try to undermine us and we're going to have to stay on code with this message and there's nothing they can do about that and if they're not going to bring any tangibles to the game we're not going to go to the polls for the democrats we will let them fall by the wayside we will change this whole political surface around and we're doing it already. We are making an impact. We got to stay the course, family. That's the thing. We got to learn how to stay focused. Don't let people start throwing out all this, all these distractions and twerking and all this. So we start getting into all these other dumbass distractions. We got to stay focused on this political process and getting tangibles and not let anybody try to water down what we're trying to do. Also, if we get to a point where we are going to get some type of payment, do not, and I repeat, do not, do not, do not let them involve any other group. The minute they let in another group, family, the minute they let in another group besides foundational black Americans, even if it's something minute, because they'll try to crowbar something little in there and then that will turn into a floodgate. Don't let them crowbar nothing and no other group into our reparations payment. The minute they do that, if they get an inch, if they get one little foot in the door for another group, I'm telling you the whole reparations thing is done. It will be trash for the next 100 years. I'm telling you, it will go the way of affirmative action. We made the big mistake in the 1960s by letting all these other damn minority groups get included. The minute they said that, we like, okay, that ain't gonna hurt. We, we, we'll share, we don't mind sharing. And we are the only people who really don't benefit from affirmative action no more. Every other group benefits from that shit. 
That's why you look at all these committees, it don't be no foundational black Americans on them. It be a whole bunch of Hispanics, immigrants, white women, gay white people, and no foundational black Americans. We the only ones who don't benefit from all this damn shit and these civil rights bills and all this stuff that we done got our brains bashed in for. Because we want to be on some kumbaya. We got to be exclusive. And not give a shit about people being upset or uncomfortable about it. Don't let nobody shame you into being on some kumbaya. We don't owe nobody nothing. We don't owe nobody nothing. We don't have to share. What about him? Little Javier over there, he hungry. Well, go back to Mexico. There's a gang of tacos and corn and all that good shit down there. Go home. That's bad what's happening to you, but I don't owe you anything. I don't. We don't owe nobody nothing. I want black folks to understand that. They've eaten off us enough. We don't owe nobody shit. We think if we don't go along, we're going to miss out on something. If we don't go along with everybody's program, we're going to be deprived of something. What are they going to take from you? They ain't giving you shit. We got this whole thing where there's some a whole big batch of butter biscuits we just going to miss out on. Ain't nobody giving us nothing to deprive us with. That's why I can give less than a damn about what somebody thinks. You ain't giving me shit anyway. And understand, all these other groups, we are the prize. The, the Democrats, Republicans, immigrant groups, we are the prize for all these other groups. Basically, all these other groups fight to see who's going to stand on our damn backs. That's all they do at the end of the day. They fight each other to see who's going to step and stand on our backs. That's what the political process is. The, the right-wingers, they step on our backs with the mass incarceration and they, they profit off that. And also just the sonic gratification of seeing us being subjugated, that's good enough to make them vote Republican. That's why all these trailer park, the hills have eyes, hillbillies love voting for Trump and supporting the white supremacists because that just makes them feel good to see black folks being stepped on and being treated worse than them. That's their gratification. What, why do you think they support Trump? What the hell has Trump done for these inbred fucking hicks? Trump is out there at mar largo golfing and eating caviar and all these broke, Funky, mayonnaise-smelling, headlights-having, wet-dog-smelling hillbillies are running around here with red MAGA hats on like dumbasses because they get a sonic gratification to see that he's going he's gonna to stick it to some of these non-white people. That's all they get out of it. Trump has not done shit for them. Not a damn thing. So they, they don't have a legitimate reason for supporting him, but they support him because of the way he treats the other people. Particularly non-white people. Specifically black people. And then the Democrats, same thing. On their side, all these other groups get to stand on top of us and get all the rights and benefits that were supposed to come to us. All the civil rights laws and bills and minority set-asides that were supposed to be us, they get off on gutting it away from us and giving it to the LGBT community, giving it to the immigrant community, giving it to the Native Americans, giving it to these women's groups. So all these people turn around and shit on us. All these women's groups, they got the whole Me Too where they use the black brute rapist stereotype to fund their movements. These immigrant groups, all of them are anti-black. These white LGBT organizations, they are anti-black. Everybody is campaigning to see who gets to step on us and walk all over us and shit on us. We are the prize. And now what's happening is there, there's a real grassroots awakening with black people. See, we've had this mentality where, and this is that boule talk, we want to get a seat at the table. That's that Roland Martin. A seat at the table. The first thing we got to do, get a seat at the table. Seat at the table. See, the problem is there ain't no seat at the table. We are the table. 
We've always been the table. We are the table so everybody can set their plates on us and eat off of us. We're all, we're the table. So we've already been at the table, but they're eating off of us. And now that we're getting up off the floor saying, okay, nobody else is eating off us. Now they're getting scared because now that we're awake, we can topple the whole thing. See, everybody was dependent upon us being on the floor so they could eat off us. Now that we're getting up, y'all can't eat off us no more. Y'all can't really eat off us no more. We getting up. We're waking up. So that whole thing, y'all ain't eating off. Y'all not going to eat off us no more. Everybody's going to have to hold their own nuts because now it's time for us to eat. And I'm pretty goddamn hungry. It's our dinner time now, and we're going to hoard food for ourselves. And I've had some white supremacists say, well, Tariq, because they love researching me and, and looking all into my damn pockets. Well, Tariq, you're doing pretty well. You live in the suburbs. Look, look at your house. What do you want reparation? What do you complain on what, what what reparations do you need? That coon said that too. Well, I grew up in the suburbs and you know, I grew up pretty in a pretty well to do. Fuck all that. Yeah, I live in the suburbs. Yeah. My house costs a certain amount of money, so the hell what? I want more. I still want what the hell is owed to me and others. Yeah. Don't don't count my damn money. And tell me what's enough for me? Give me all of it. Don't tell me it was. Well, you got enough. No. I could be a damn billionaire. If it wasn't for systematic racism, hell. I work too damn hard. I could have 10 times as much money. If I had compensatory justice. Give me my goddamn money and get the hell out of my pocket. Give me them tangibles. Well, you got a big house. Well, damn it, I'm going to get two of them. Give me my motherfucking money and get out my pocket and go back to the trailer park. You dig? He, that's right. He said Jewish millionaires, they get reparations. Let me tell you something. I've seen white people who are rich who, who be doing welfare schemes. I've seen rich white people do welfare scams. I saw it was a case up in Seattle some years back. There was some millionaire white people. They had some kind of welfare thing. They were some shit they were going to. They were getting like free welfare and they were already millionaires. You don't tell white people you got enough money. White people gonna get every dime they can damn get. And nobody questions them that. Jap Japanese too. They gonna get every penny they can get. You ain't going to tell them you got enough. Don't run that game on us. No, give me the gold. Give me the whole bag. Give me all the bag. You dig? Anyway, let me get up out of here, y'all. Go to HiddenColorsFilm.com. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, get your tickets to see Hidden Colors 5 the most anticipated movie of the summer, Hidden Colors 5. Y'all go get your tickets, ladies and gentlemen. And follow me on Instagram at Tariq Elite. Follow me on Twitter at Tariq Nasheed. I'm a holler.